Welcome to Hull on Estates, a series of podcasts for the Canadian legal community dealing with issues and insights surrounding estate planning in Canada. Hosted by the lawyers of Hull and Hull, the podcast will touch on some key considerations when planning estates and wills. Now, here are today's hosts. Hi, welcome to Hull and Estate. I'm Nicole Chanchi. And I'm Paul Trudell. How are you today, Nicole? Doing well, Paul. Happy Friday. How are you doing? Happy Friday. I'm great. Thanks. We're just enjoying the the, the last weeks of summer and uh, hopefully it'll stay warm for some time and we can enjoy the sun for the rest of uh, the season anyway. Mm -hmm. Uh, Speaking of sun, and this is not the best segue, but we're going to talk today about a son, a mother, and a transfer of a property from a mother to a son and whether that was effective in law. So maybe you can, the, the case is Chan v. Chan, and we'll put the link up on our um, our posting. Um, it's a case out of the Alberta Queen's Bench, but it has implications for uh, it, Ontario as well, and the effect uh, of uh, registration or non-registration of a transfer, and uh, whether such a transfer is effective. So maybe you can tell us a bit about the background of Chan v. Chan. Sure. Thank you, Paul. So the issue raised in this case was whether legal title to real property can transfer after the transfer is executed, but before it is registered. So Justice Grant, uh, the Court of Queen's Bench in Alberta, ruled that it does not. So um, in this case, a mother who now is deceased executed a transfer of her legal title to her property to her adult son for no consideration seven months prior to her death. The transfer was not registered on on title prior to, to her death. So her son tried to register the transfer document after her death, stating that he uh, nor his mother knew that the transfer was to be registered. Um, And so a a quote that Paul and I (laughs) like from this case uh, by Justice Dunlop, which he noted, um, he said, everybody is bound by the law, whether they know the law or not. So unfortunately, even though they they thought that the the transfer didn't have to be registered, the fact that it wasn't um, it, it made the, um, I guess, the transfer after the fact or the intention to transfer after the fact uh, would, would be improper. So it's it's a, a secondary issue to this is the uh, resulting trust, the presumption of resulting trust, which I guess we can get into a little later. But uh, essentially, you know, the daughters of the deceased brought this application um, for a declaration that the asset or the, the, the property formed part of her estate. And the court granted the application for the simple reason that the transfer executed by the deceased did not transfer her ownership uh, to her son because it while it, while it remained unregistered. So it, it should have been registered prior to her death. But the fact that it was not, um, unfortunately, uh, in this case, would have made the the, the transfer improper. So. Right. So the, 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 the league, there is no league. They didn't give legal effect to the transfer after death, saying that that's not something that uh, uh, can be done after the transfer or passes away. Um, we've seen a similar case, the case of uh, Thompson and the Elliott estate in Ontario that deals with zombie deeds. And we've logged on that. Um, in that case, the deceased attempted to transfer her property to herself in order to sever joint tenancy. Um, the transfer through error wasn't registered until after she died. And the court felt held there that registering the transfer after the deceased passed away uh, was improper and shouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. The court went on to find, though, that because the deceased in that case uh, took all the steps possible and delivered the deed and uh, dealt with the property as if it was transferred, the court held that there was enough evidence there to find that the joint tenancy was severed. Um, However, it did uh, have some harsh words and criticism for attempting to register this deed after death. In, in both of those cases, the deed wasn't registered prior to death through error. In the first case, they didn't know the, that it had to be registered in order to be effective. In the second case, the lawyer misfiled the registration. And uh, uh, for that reason, the registration wasn't filed prior to death. We do see cases where this is done, uh, transfer after death is done in order to avoid probate fees. So if I have a property, um, I may sign a a transfer, transferring it to my son, for example. And um, I won't say which one I'm transferring it to. Um, and, And that isn't registered until after death. During, during my lifetime, I can deal with it still and sell it or mortgage it or whatever. Um, after I die, my son can then will then try to register that title, um, and it's outside of my estate and it's not subject to probate fees. Um, but we know now uh, it's clear now from the Thompson decision and this Chan decision that such a, tra- a registration after death is is not effective and is uh, improper. 
Yeah, and, and they have, um, I like um, the, the saying here, or I guess we blog on this before, but the, the concept of a, a zombie deed. So right. uh, which in, in Thompson, uh, the court said um, it's uh, it's referred to as a zombie deed because it's said to come back to life after after the testators passed away. So this uh, direction or authorization to transfer the property it's just kind of, you know, it exists. And then all of a sudden, you know, after the deceased passes away, it comes back to life. So it's known as a zombie deed. So I found that <laughs> that concept um, right. interesting. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it is. And just one last point on Chan, the, the court. Yeah. found that the title remained with the estate. However, it didn't preclude the son from making a claim in equity to say that there was a gift intended or that he's entitled to um, the property on the basis of uh, an equitable claim. I guess the difference there is that um, because legal title is with the estate, the claim would be by the son against the estate for his equitable claim rather than the estate suing the son to get legal title back. Yes. So there's a bit of a difference there, but at the end of the day, the uh, the upshot may be the same. The son may still have a, a claim. Okay, well, I think that brings us to the end of our discussion of uh, zombie deeds and uh, whether they're effective, they're not, and um, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Thanks very much, Nicole. Thank you so much, Paul. Great to see you. Okay, thanks. Okay, bye, everyone. This has been Hall on Estates with the lawyers of Hall and Hall. The podcast you have been listening to has been provided as an information service. It is a summary of current legal issues in estates and estate planning. It is not legal advice, and you are reminded to always talk with a legal professional regarding your specific circumstances. To listen to other podcasts or to leave a question or comment, please visit our website at hullandhull.com. Our theme music is Upper Structure by DJ A Kid and is courtesy of the Podsafe Music Network.